again to the third and final day of the IC3 Church Growth and Development Conference. Let's thank God for being here. We need to be in high expectation of what God can do this morning. And I don't know about you, but I have been renewed. I have been recharged. I have been set free just in these two days alone. So I want you to prepare your hearts and pray for all of our preachers and our speakers and our teachers on this day. Do you feel officially welcome this morning? Amen, amen. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for this beautiful rainy day that you have afforded us. God, we thank you for the opportunity to be here. We don't know what sacrifice that our brother or sister had to undergo to be here, God, but we thank you. So God, we won't get here and, and act like we're a statue. We won't get here and not be in the moment. But God, we will recognize that you blessed us to be here because there's somebody that desired to be here but couldn't. So God, right now we ask that you continue to saturate us with your precious Holy Spirit that worship will refresh us, that the word and the testimonies will renew us. God, we ask that each person that is seeking to hear from you specifically today, that you would take the words of all the speakers of the music ministry, of the facilitators, and minister to them in the way that they need individually and specifically. This is our prayer on this day. In the name of Jesus, the people of God collectively together say, amen. Amen, you may be seated. We have a few announcements. I wanna remind you to download the registration, uh, the app, if you have not done so already. Please uh, download the registration app. Today is the last day, the last day to uh, get the, the lowest price registration price on the 2020 IC3 conference. And so don't wait till next year. Don't worry about if you're not sure if you're gonna come or not. Just register today, amen? Get it done, save some money. Don't wait last minute. We also wanna continue to encourage you not to record, be uh, respectful to the conference, be respectful to the conference, amen? Be respectful to the conference. As you know, uh, we have uh, MP3 DVDs and CDs for sale. Please, we wanna encourage you to not only think about yourselves, but think about somebody that could not be here. I cannot tell you how many people are serving in churches that don't have a conference budget, people who cannot take off of work. So if you sat in any session this week and thought to yourself, gosh, I wish so-and-so would have been here, then we wanna encourage you to purchase purchase something for them so that you could be a blessing to them in their ministry at this time of need. Amen? We want to encourage you to do that. Uh, also, we want to remind you that our premier sponsors have been a blessing to us this week, uh, Compassion International and Logos. And so we invite you to stop by their registration table and ask for your discount specifically from IC3 on this day. Let's continue to pray for everyone that will come and we ask you to just enjoy the rest of this day and get what you need on this day, amen? amen. Anybody can testify that the Lord has been good to you this week. Come on, come where the people that can say God has been real good. Why don't you tell your neighbor God has been good to me this week. Hallelujah. Anybody just want to offer him some praise?
as Pastor Emeritus of the historic Mount Moriah Baptist Church of Los Angeles, Inc. Known for his expositional preaching and teaching, Dr. Wade has served as the citywide revival evangelist for over 12 major cities in the country. Dr. Wade is the former president of the National Missionary Baptist Convention of America and played a pivotal role in the historical coming together of the four National Baptist Conventions. Reverend Wade is an accomplished singer and songwriter. With his father, Dr. J.C. Wade Sr., and his brother, Dr. J.C. Wade Jr., he's authored a series of books entitled These Three, which contains sermons shared from the pulpits occupied by the Wades. Presently, he serves as board member of the Gospel Music Workshop of America, Inc., a lecturer for the E.K. Bailey Expository Preaching Conference, and is a lifetime member of the NAACP. Please welcome Reverend Dr. Melvin Von Wade, Sr. While you're standing, so that you won't have to stand again, would you turn with me to Mark? Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse number 35 from the English Standard Version. I'm old King James, but the young men have been getting after me, so I thought I'd try to update. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. He said to them, Let us go to the next town that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. You may be seated. To Dr. Ralph West, whom I affectionately call little brother, even though he's taller than me, and to Dr. Cynthia Hale, chairman, and to all of the board, and to all of you, my brothers and sisters, it is a delight and a joy. I thought one while it was, but after I heard all of the speakers, I don't know whether it is or not putting me up behind all of what I have heard these days. But certainly we thank God for this privilege to stand before you this morning. Thankful that I've got my son here with me, Reverend David Wade from Mesa, Arizona. Then I got my grandbaby, uh, Sydney, and then I've got Markel, and then I've got Charlotte. Certainly glad to see the Gilberts, whom they have known the Wades for many years, and we would care to know, and thankful to all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. You pray for me, won't you? There is a statement that says, from a biblical perspective, all things can be accomplished through prayer but nothing should be done before prayer. So as a prelude to our theme, Leading in Uncharted Territory, I want to encourage us to start with prayer. An Anglican priest by the name of Stuart Barton Babbage wrote a book called The Vacuum of Unbelief. In that book, he made the statement that you could almost write the life of Christ based upon him being interrupted by events that were not on his daily calendar. Now, I've come to see that that statement is not fake news, but it is unvarnished truth. In Mark 1, Jesus was teaching in a synagogue in Capernaum, and his teaching was interrupted 
by a man with an unclean spirit. In chapter 2, he was in a home in a Capernaum teaching, and he was interrupted by four men who tore a hole in the roof and let down a paralyzed man. In chapter 3, Jesus was dealing with some scribes who said that he was possessed by Beelzebub, and he was interrupted by his mother and brothers. In chapter 4, he sleep in the stern of a ship, and he was interrupted by his panic-stricken disciples. In chapter 5, he was teaching, and while he was teaching, he was interrupted by Mr. Jairus, whose daughter was gravely ill. On his way to see about Mr. Jairus' daughter, Jesus' interruption was interrupted by a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years. In chapter 6, Jesus takes his disciple to a desolate place in order to take a break. And his taking a break was interrupted by a great cow who were like sheep without a shepherd. In chapter 7, Jesus retreats to a house and seeks to be incognito, but as usual, he was interrupted by a woman who had a little daughter with an unclean spirit. Well, let me just fast forward. The ultimate interruption of Jesus was when he was dying on the cross, and his dying was interrupted by a thief on the right side who said, Lord, when thou comest into thy kingdom, remember me. And our text is a classic example of Jesus being interrupted. Now, in order to put this interruption into proper context, it should be noted that in Mark chapter 1, Jesus was dealing and had dealt with demons, devil, death, and disease. So after having devil dealt with demons, devils, death, and disease, he's now become exhausted. His humanness had experienced lessened and diminished strength. Being pressed and spent both day and night says that his energy level had been reduced. And in order for Jesus to be quickened and revivified, it becomes necessary for him to get alone and experience the revitalization that comes with solitary aloneness. But the question is, how does Jesus get to be alone? From the time that Jesus expelled the demon in the synagogue and healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law, his fame spread throughout all of Galilee and crowds flocked around him, which means that privacy and solitary aloneness becomes virtually impossible. But even though aloneness seemed virtually impossible, Jesus was aware of the fruits and energized strength that comes from being alone. Jesus knew that aloneness would give him renewed strength, whereby he would be able to capably meet the needs of a gravely ill multitude. But the question is still, how can the popular Jesus accomplish this seemingly impossible yet needful task? There are four verbs in our text that emphasize Jesus' desire to have fellowship with his Father privately, and they are rising, departed, went, and pray. And I want to talk this morning about the aloneness of Christ. In verse 35 it says, And in the morning rising up a great while before day, he went out into a solitary place and there prayed. In other words, Jesus got up early while it was still dark, while everybody was still asleep, and goes to a solitary place. That leads us then to the idea of his vital privacy. Now, brothers and sisters, I've discovered that we have not yet learned the lesson of our Lord. We don't know the value or fruits of private aloneness. We don't know much about solitude and detachment, for that's not the orientation of our day. We can't relate because this is an entourage culture. We are crowd-oriented. We major in mingling. As a result, we have not developed the discipline of spiritual disengagement. We don't have the spiritual habit of being alone. And perhaps, brothers and sisters, that accounts for the fact that we as individual believers and collectively as a church, we are experiencing a famine of power and a shortage of influence. Maybe that's why we have full hands but empty spirits. Maybe that's why we are many but we ain't much. Maybe. That's why we resemble factoids, cotton candy, and moraine. We are tasty, we're all fluff, but 
no substance. Maybe that's why we have degenerated to the level of cheese whiz Christians and synthetic saint and cheese whiz is fake and synthetic is artificial. Maybe that's why some church folk have buffet style faith and free agency religion. Maybe that's why we've got so many believers who try and believe that they can live in Egypt and that Egypt is Israel 10x and thus they try to eat at Pharaoh's table and be liberated at the same time. Maybe that's why one writer paradoxically calls us noble savages. Maybe that's why the church was founded to be a haven of grace and proclaim grace has now diluted that grace and now the church has become a haven of ungrace which is a disgrace. Maybe that accounts for the fact that we've got vertebrae Christians in the church and you know a vertebrae is spineless and have no backbone. Maybe. That's why we've got some preachers who are short on substance but long on style. <laughs> maybe, maybe, just, just, just maybe. That's why we've got so many people who have shallow water attire rather than scuba diving deep water equipment. Maybe that's why we got so many Christians who are all nouns, but there are no verbs. Maybe that's why we've got agoraphobic believers who have a fear of going outside. Maybe that's why we've got people uh, who are like chewing gum. They're all motion, but no progress. Maybe that's why we've got so many in the church who act as if we're on a cruise ship and not on a battleship. Maybe that's why we've got Iceberg churches, cold storage members, unemotional, glacier-like deacons, and refrigerated people, preachers. Maybe, maybe that's why we've got so many Christians who are like a little boy who fell out of bed one night. The story is that a little boy fell out of bed one night, and the next morning, his mother said to him, Son, how did you fall out of bed last night? He said, Mother, uh, the reason I fell out of bed last night but because I stayed too close to where I first got in. And maybe that, that's, that's some of us. Now I stand here today to tell you there is a need for both the church and the pastor, the pulpit and the pew to hide themselves. In 1 Kings chapter 18, God tells the prophet Elijah to go and show himself unto Ahab. But that was a necessary prelude and a prerequisite for going and showing, and that necessary prelude is found in 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 3. God says, get thee hence and hide thyself. And the word for hide translates to our word absent and that's what we need to do we need to absent ourselves you see we're too public we know how to be present but we need to learn how to lock the door and unplug our landline turn off our cell phones our iphones our instagram our facebook our twitters our emails our internets our wi-fi's our periscope our snapchats our skypes our facetime all messaging apps and unplug our earplugs and shut up and shut in so that nobody can invade our holy intimacy we need to go incognito in fact we need to be spiritually and divinely sequestered now the reason is like the people were doing where Jesus was concerned all men are now seeking us men are gravely ill and uh, there are those who are like the woman with the issue of blood. They've tried everything, and everything has failed. And they've been told that the church is the salt of the earth, the light 
of the world, the city on a hill. They have been told that we have the balm of Gilead to make the wounded whole. They've been told that we've got the bread of eternal life. They've been told that we've got the book, which is the Bible, which has the answers to all of man's problems, either explicitly or implicitly. And they have been told that our preaching is the language of satisfaction. And I've learned an expression that is Latin called terminus ad quem. Now, that expression has to do with purpose and course of action. And the terminus ad quem of every Christian is to worship, witness, and work. And the terminus ad quem of every preacher is to have fidelity to unvarnished truth and proclaim with power the word of God and the design of that comes in the idea of preach but let me tell you what I did I printed uh, the word preach on a piece of paper with, with with a pencil and I decided to see if I could get another word out of the word preach and I, I erased the P and I got reach and I said well let's see if I can get another word and I erased the hour and I got each and I said, let me see if I can get another word. And I erased the E, and phonetically it comes out A. And I discovered that's the design of preaching, to reach each A. But now we can accomplish our purposes being too public. We've got to be divinely sequestered. And the Bible, brothers and sisters, people are coming to us uh, like that man that was at the temple gate, they're looking for us to give us some such as I have. And you can't give out some such as I have being too public. The psalmist writes, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Jesus told the multitude in his Sermon on the Mount that when they pray, go to the secret closet and shut the door. And then, you know, there was a movie called uh, War Room, and that old lady said that the secret closet is the more war room. So Jesus tells us, brothers and sisters, that we got to go into seclusion if we're going to have power. Austin Miles, I think, knows that, for he wrote, he wrote a hymn called I Come to the Garden Alone While the Dew is Still on the Roses, and the voice I hear falling on my ear the Son of God disclosed. He speaks and the sound of his voice. It's so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. He walks with me and talks with me and tells me that I am his own. So we must make concentrated efforts to get all by ourselves. Now, brothers and sisters, we got to understand something and that is that privacy and solitude are vital to our spiritual well-being, but they are not to be lone activities for in order for solitude to be vitally beneficial, we've got to couple vital privacy with vital prayer. The Bible says Jesus departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Now, Eugene Peterson, I thought I'd get this since uh, I'm in with all of these scholars, I thought I'd give me a little scholarship. Uh, Eugene Peterson talks about apophatic praying and cataphatic praying. Now, apophatic praying is praying with your eyes closed, and cataphatic praying is praying with your eyes open. Now, Mark does not tell us that Jesus did or did not have his eyes either open or closed. Or nor does he give us any content of the prayer of Jesus. You know, Mark is labeled as the action gospel, which means he's focused on the actions of Jesus. And here he wants us to be focused on the fact that Jesus attached great significance to the preference, purposeful practice of vital prayer. And it's a spiritual axiom. That word axiom means a truth that is so obvious it don't even need no proof that Jesus knew that the key to his public power was his purposeful, private, vital prayer. Look at it. The Bible says he prayed when he baptized. He 
prayed after the, in a solitary place. He prayed before he chose his 12 disciples. He prayed in the wilderness. He prayed before he fed the 5,000. He prayed after he fed the 5,000. He prayed at Caesarea Philippi before he asked his disciples, whom do the people say that I am? He prayed on the mountain where he was transfigured. He prayed in the temple. He prayed before he extended the invitation, come unto me, all you that labor. He prayed just before he taught his disciples the model prayer. He prayed for little children. Children. He prayed at Lazarus' tomb before he raised Lazarus from the dead. He prayed for Peter before Peter denied him. He prayed during the night of the institution of the Lord's Supper. In fact, he prayed so in the garden of Gethsemane before he went to his trial and the cross until he experienced hematidrosis, which is a sweating blood. He prayed on the cross. He prayed at Emmaus after his resurrection. And to show you how much Jesus believes in prayer, he still prayed. He's interceding for you and me right now. Now, brothers and sisters, let me just say this. It seems to me that individually and even collectively, we don't seem to know how vital prayer really is. That's why many of our churches are like the flowers placed in the church on Sundays, alive on Sunday but dead by Wednesday. In fact, when we listen to some people, uh, we get the idea that uh, they really don't know what prayer really is. So let me not be presumptuous, assume that everybody knows what prayer is. Now, I know this might be elementary for some people, but just, just count it and not in my heart, all right? Uh, prayer begins and ends with relationship. That means that uh, we've experienced mystical, reciprocal indwelling. Well, that means uh, total chimerism. Well, well, that means hypostatic union. That, that means I'm in him and he's in me. John says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And so, brothers and sisters, let me start by telling you what prayer is by telling you what it ain't. Prayer is not some device that we use to impress a listening audience to show off out of a spirit of ostentation. Prayer is not some vehicle where we send God on a here, there, and everywhere excursion. Prayerful, prayer is not skillful negotiation. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. Prayer is not a means of manipulating or controlling God. Prayer is not informing God because God is not after information. Prayer is not a marvelous display of historical oratory. Prayer is not verbose rhetoric. Prayer is not handing God a deity do list. Prayer is not a pretentious display of simply saying words. Well, there's more to prayer than just naming and claiming because prayer is the central and shaping language of the church. Prayer is the needful practice of the Christian. Prayer is the practice of the presence of God. Prayer is the place where pride is stripped and abandoned humility is adopted. Supplication is made. Dependence on God is claimed. Needs are admitted. Faith is exercised and hope is lifted. Let me tell you, we, one of the problems of the church is that we don't read our Bible. And that's why some of us don't know what really prayer really is. You see, you got to read your Bible. Let me tell you what Proverbs 28 and 9 says. It's he that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. Which means you got to spend some time in the word. Well, let me tell you, uh, you know, uh, Freddie Haynes and E.K. Bailey got me into looking up illustrations. So one day I had a cold, and I went to this place called Simply Wholesome, and I wanted to get some tea uh, with, uh, that dealt with colds. And uh, so I finally got this box of tea. Well, for those of you who know, I had leukemia, and I was instructed by my wife to always read labels and all of that, even uh, side effects, that kind of thing. So I was reading, uh, the, and would you believe that that tea box, Freddie, went to preaching? I, I, could not, I could not believe that this tea box went to preaching. Can I, anybody want to know what it said? This, this is what the tea box said. The longer you soak it, the stronger it gets. Yeah. 
so brothers and sisters, when you soak, when, when you soak in the word, you, you will discover that prayer is a spirit-inspired communion with God. It comes from the Holy Spirit, who is our prayer partner, and not just from us alone. Prayer is an honest and simple conference with God. Prayer is laying hold of God's will. Prayer is stored up treasures in heaven. Practice Prayer affects what God does, but it don't change God. Prayer is a cell phone in your bosom which has a direct line to heaven. Prayer is a necessary holy habit and a costly business. Prayer is urgent, be intense, beseeching, begging, and requesting. It's speaking, calling, and crying. Prayer, I tell you, is earth getting heaven. Prayer is a ladder with many rungs and connects the earthly with the heavenly. Prayer is heaven listening and hell trembling. Prayer is omnidirectional because it affects three worlds at the same time. It affects heaven, earth, and hell. It's a shield to the soul, a sacrifice to God, and a scourge to Satan. It goes up to God in worship, out to man in work, and down to Satan in warfare. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity, in my heart, the Lord will hear me. Jeremiah says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Matthew 7 and 7 asks, And it shall be given you, seek, and ye shall find not, and it shall be opened unto you. Matthew 21 and 22, and all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, ye shall receive. 1 John 5, 14 and 50. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us and if we know that he hear us whatever we ask we know that we have the petition that we desire of him and brothers and sisters for you in this technological age would you believe because of prayer you can set up a chat room anywhere but you know I've discovered we got some Christians who are, are real busy and they allow their busy schedule to interfere with their prayer life. And sometimes we get too busy to pray or pray like we should. But I want to tell you something. I don't find nobody any busier than Jesus. And yet Jesus found time to pray. Do I have a witness? And I want to serve notice this morning that anybody who follows Jesus who trivializes prayer and becomes too busy to pray, you're too busy. And you better watch out because if you're not careful, God who prioritizes prayer will unbusy you. He will allow your weather to change and you will be confronted with a pressurized predicament. God will steer you into a cul-de-sac of despair and you got no way out and what he will do is he will humiliate and subordinate you by sending you organized and orchestrated tragedy and he'll trap you between disaster and devastation and when he sends organized and orchestrated tragedy your way and when you find yourself trapped between disaster, devastation, organized and orchestrated tragedy, your narcissistic self-reliant ego centric world crumbles and comes to a standstill and the only thing you can do is pray. Do I have a witness? But let me tell you something. Uh, I had a deacon by the name of uh, Brother Finesse Graham. You didn't know him. But uh, Joe Gregory made the statement that everybody ought to have an iconic statement that lives after you are gone. And Brother Graham had uh, that kind of a statement, you know. He did not have what you call philosophical intellectuality, but he did have theological intuition. You see, we used to laugh at him when he would get up and talk on Monday nights at, at the close of prayer meeting because everybody knew what he was going to say. He'd always stand up and say with bad English, what prayer can't do can't be did. Well, my mother, my mother, her name was Mary, and when I did her funeral, uh, I had what I call some of her Maryisms, and one of my mother's Maryism, that was her name, Mary, and one of her Maryisms was, uh, singing moves men, but prayer moves God. Now, uh, I have a kind of a theological definition of prayer, and one theologian said it like this, prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscles of omnipotence. And I'm here today to tell you that prayer is vital, but then prayer is also power there is power and can you say there is power in prayer well 
let, let me give it to you like this. The report is, and I've just learned this recently, that it is said that when a ram is about to engage in battle, he bends his knees and bows his head and says, in essence, when I come up off my knees, I'm coming up with power. And brothers and sisters, it would seem to me that we ought to know. We ought to at least have ram sense. Prayer is vital and, 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 and there's power in prayer. Well, let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, Abraham prayed and God healed Abimelech and his whole household. Moses prayed and the fire was quenched. Ha Baron Hannah prayed and conceived Samuel. Samson prayed, his strength was renewed. David prayed and was forgiven, cleansed, purged, and had his jaw restored. Hezekiah prayed and 15 years was added to his life. Elijah prayed and it didn't rain for three years and six months. Elisha prayed and the Shunammite son was raised from the dead. Job prayed and God gave him twice as much after his suffering than he had before his suffering. Daniel prayed and the mouths of hunky lion were locked. Peter prayed and darkness was raised from the dead. The church prayed and Peter was delivered from chains. And I'm just trying to tell you there's power in vital prayer. Paul and Silas prayed and there was an earthquake. The dungeon shook. The chains fell off. The jail doors opened and a sinner wanted to be saved. Well, my daddy prayed and did you not know he told God he didn't want his children to go up without a mother like he did and God delivered his, well, his wife and I prayed and God through my brother gave me a bone marrow transplant 20 years ago and now I'm leukemia free. I'm trying to tell you that prayer is, I wish I had some witnesses here. Well, brothers and sisters, let me just tell you this. Since this is true, what I've been telling you all the time, can I tell you something you ought to pray anywhere? Can you, say, can you say anywhere? You ought to pray in the field like Abraham did, and at the well like Eliezer did, in the deep like Jonah did, on an ash pile like Job did, in bondage like the Israelites did, in the deep like Jonah did, in the bed like Hezekiah did, in the crowd like the bleeding woman did, in the street like Jairus did, in a boat like the disciples did, on the run like Elijah did, in chains and blindness like Samson did, in a cave like David did, in a stinking dungeon like Jeremiah did, in the far country like the prodigal did, in a cave like David did, in the upper room like the 120 did, from house to house like the early church did, in jail like Peter, Paul and Silas did, on the ground like Stephen did, on the mountain like Jesus did, on the cross like the thief did, in the church like the tax collector did, you ought to pray any where. Do I have a witness? Not only ought you to pray anywhere, can you say anyhow? Short like the publican did, long like Moses did, in silence like Hannah did, in distress like Manasseh did, in desperation like Jeremiah did, bitterly like Ezra did, in secret thoughts like Nehemiah did, in sackcloth and ashes like the Ninevites did, in song and praise like Habakkuk did, loud as the Syrophoenician woman did, always like Cornelius did, in tears like Mary Magdalene did, in disgrace and humiliation like Samson did, in guilt like David did, every day like the church did, all night and sweating blood like Jesus did, with your windows open like Daniel did, on your face like the leper did, while falling to your knees like Stephen did, while standing like the Levites and the congregation did, while sitting like David did, while bowing like Moses did, while singing and dancing like Miriam did, with lifted hands like Solomon did, prostrate like Joshua did, pounding on your breast like the tax collector did, and looking up like Jesus did. You ought to pray anywhere, anyhow, but can you say anytime? Before day like Jesus did, in the morning, noon, and night like David did, three times a day like Daniel did, at midnight like Paul and Silas did, in childhood like Samuel did, in youth like day Timothy did, in young adulthood like Jesus did, in old age like Anna did, in sickness like Hezekiah did, when surrounded by your enemies like Elisha did, in barrenness like Hannah did, in a storm like the disciples did, while sinking like Peter did, while dying like Stephen did, and in death like Paul did. You ought to pray anywhere, anyhow. Anytime, 
but that's not all. You ought to pray for any need. Well, what are you saying, Brother Wade? You ought to pray for God to spare a people like Abraham did, for your wife to have children like Isaac did, for deliverance like the Israelites did, for water like Moses did, for revelation like Gideon did, for another chance like Samson did, for divine intervention like Jehoshaphat did, for length and life like Hezekiah did, for confession for sin like Ezra did, for a clean heart like David did, and for violence like Manoah did, for your children like Job did, for wisdom like Solomon did, for favor from the enemy like Jehovah has did, for sight like Bartimaeus did, for rain like Elijah did, for open eyes like Elisha did, for a son like Hannah did, for the Lord's people like Samuel did, for dream interpretation like Daniel did, for understanding like Jeremiah did, for enlightened like men, like Cornelius did, for God not to take you out like the Ninevites did, for help like Amos did, for healing like the centurion did, for wholeness like the bleeding woman did, for mercy like the lepers did, for rescuing like Peter did, for remembrance like the thief did, for forgiveness of your enemies like like Jesus did, for grace like Paul did, for salvation like I did, and I'm here to tell you, Jesus is on the main line, and I'm a witness, and I'm a witness, won't he hear your faintest cry, and he will. My time is up, but ain't he all right? Won't it work for you? Yes! Can you say yes? Have you tried prayer? If you tried prayer, you can come out with power. Power! Thank you. 
ministry of Dr. Melvin Von Wade, our elder statesman. We thank God for the word on this morning. We're going to prepare for a 10-minute break. How many minutes did I say? 10, which means you should prepare really in eight minutes. During this time, we want you to stop by the Logos table. We want you to stop by the Logos table uh, and purchase if you can, especially while you can get the IC3 discount, purchase Logos. I personally have Logos 8. It is phenomenal for the preacher and preachers. We need to be prepared, amen? So please stop by the Logos table. They will only be here till noon, so this is your last chance. Please stop by, and we're going to ask that you move efficiently and come back so you can be seated and not disruptive when the uh, story time speakers prepare. Last but not least, before our break, we want to share with you the book from our uh, Pastor Wade, uh, These Three. His book is available. We want you to be a blessing to him. If you've heard the preaching today, you know that this great man of God has a lot to offer us. And so please get his book. All right? We'll see you back here in how many minutes? Eight. Eight. <laughs> 